There are a lot of historians that agree that the modern American culture really starts in the 1920s. So what exactly is this culture? Well, stick around because that's what we're going to talk about today in Mr. E's Classroom. Hey ladies and gentlemen, Mr. E here. Today's topic is the culture of the 1920s. A lot of historians say this is where modern American culture starts. The question we're going to try to look at and answer today is, how did Americans express the changing culture of the era? So grab yourself a pencil and paper, get ready to take some notes. Pay attention to the video and hopefully by the end you'll have an answer. The first big concept we need to talk about is the rise of what we call mass culture. Mass culture happens when you have a society that shares similar culture all over the place, usually because of things like new types of technologies, new types of communications, advertising, stuff like that. In the 1920s, things like automobiles, the rise of the radio, movies, Things like that started to create a mass culture here in the United States. Basically, everybody wound up getting the exact same thing, no matter where they were at. This typically was a phenomenon that you saw mostly within the cities, but not necessarily exclusively. Slowly, people in the rural areas adopted this mass culture as well. One of the biggest things that helped create this mass culture in the United States was the radio. By the 1920s, the radio wasn't necessarily a new invention, but it was really starting to come into its own. It was an incredibly new, powerful means of communication that just about everybody had access to. By the 1920s, 50% or more of households in the United States had a radio. If you yourself didn't have a radio, you definitely knew somebody that did or you had access to one somehow. Radio is really what helped us establish what we would call a national culture. So what exactly are people listening to on this newfangled radio thing? To be honest, it's really not a whole lot different than what we do today with radios. Of course, people listen to music. That was probably the number one thing. But a lot of people use this as a source to get news or weather updates. It was also where most people heard advertisements for new products. You also had things like soap operas or radio dramas. It was also a key way to get sporting events. The big thing, though, is that everyone, pretty much everywhere in the United States, was listening to about the same thing, no matter where you were. East Coast, West Coast, North, South. You basically got about the same thing. Movies also played a huge role in this development of mass culture. Pretty much anywhere you went, you could see the same movie right about the same time. In the 1920s, it was known as the Golden Age of Hollywood. Hollywood was cranking out movie after movie after movie, literally dozens every month. In the early 1920s, the silent film was still the king. Probably the most popular silent film star of the day was a guy named Charlie Chaplin. And this went on for pretty much most of the decade. But then in 1927, a movie called The Jazz Singer was released. The Jazz Singer gets credit for being the first what we call talkie film. A talkie film is basically just a movie that has dialogue in the film that the audience actually gets to hear the actors or actresses speak. This was totally new. People hadn't seen this before, heard this before. The technology to sync up the audio and the video in a movie really just hadn't been around. Basically, the way the old silent films worked was you would see uh, an actor or actress's mouth move, then there would be a cut scene to some actual printed words, which would be just a, a quick synopsis of the dialogue being spoken. Then they would cut back to the actress and act, actor or actress uh, with some more action, then they cut away to some written dialogue. But in 1927, with the release of The Jazz Singer, when an actor or actress's mouth moved in that movie, you actually got to hear exactly what they were saying, exactly when they said it. This just absolutely blew people's minds. They were amazed by this. Mass culture also brought 
about this idea of a national hero. National heroes in the 1920s took a couple different shapes. In the 20s, sports were huge. Again, thanks to the radio and also thanks to things like movies, people all over the country were introduced to the same sports stars. People like Babe Ruth, who was a huge baseball star of the day. A golfer by the name of Bobby Jones. Bobby Jones is said to have had the absolute perfect golf swing. There was a boxer by the name of Jack Dempsey that also got huge following all over the country. These were incredibly well-known sports figures because everybody got to hear about them. But it wasn't exclusively sports heroes. National heroes could also easily take the shape of somebody that accomplished something very significant. A fantastic example of this was a pilot by the name of Charles Lindbergh. In 1927, Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly an airplane across the Atlantic Ocean from North America to Europe non-stop. Now today we don't even think about that. That's a trip that takes a couple hours in an airplane. It's not a big deal. But in 1927 when this happened, this was phenomenal. Many, many people had tried. Many, many people had failed. Charles Lindbergh helped design an airplane called the Spirit of St. Louis. Basically, it was a big giant wing and gas tank. It took them about 30 hours of non-stop flying. This is before we had things like autopilot, but he eventually did it. He flew from North America to Europe, uh, like I said, about 30 hours and became just a f huge sensation here in North America, but also in Europe. Mass culture also helps take the credit for creating what has become known as the new woman. In the 1920s, women really were looking for a lot more freedom, equality, and general control of their lives. A lot of this is due to the 19th Amendment, the passage of the 19th Amendment. The quintessential new woman was a lady that was known as a flapper. Now, a flapper was kind of the extreme new women. Not every woman in the 20s was a, a flapper. But they, the flapper really kind of envelops or embraces this idea of uh, breaking out of the norms, doing new things. A flapper is known for the fashion that they wear, short skirts, uh, kind of cutting-edge fashion. In the 1920s, the saying was that a flapper's hemline went up and their neckline went down. It was kind of the new fashion trend. A flapper also wore this new stuff called makeup that was really kind of hitting the market and becoming big. Flappers generally cut their hair relatively short in an, uh, a, a haircut known as a bob. This was an extreme uh, diversion from the way women used to be. It used to be women would have incredibly long hair. Flappers come along and they whack it all off and uh, don't look back. Flappers are also uh, known for doing very unwomanly like or unladylike things like smoking and drinking or dancing some of the latest and greatest dance crazes like the Charleston or the Cha Cha. Things that we would think of today as being pretty old fashioned, but back in the 20s, those were pretty scandalous dances. Here's a fantastic picture of a group of flappers, these new ladies that are out there to really break those social norms. Look at how they're dressed, how they look. You can see ankles and, oh my gosh, knees. To us, this is nothing big, but in the 1920s, this was considered almost borderline being vulgar. The 1920s also brought us the Lost Generation. The Lost Generation was a group of post-Great War writers that really weren't very happy with the direction that the United States was headed in the 1920s with this kind of new culture. They didn't like how people were really embracing commercialism. The Lost Generation writers also were really dealing with a lot of uh, issues that came up because a lot of them uh, were in the Great War and saw what happened firsthand. Some of the better known Lost Generation writers are a guy named F. Scott Fitzgerald. He was famous for writing a book called The Great Gatsby. Some of you are going to get lucky enough to be able to read this in your English class. Another pretty famous 
lost generation writer is a guy by the name of Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway's first major hit was a book called Farewell to Arms. Ernest Hemingway was definitely one of these lost generation writers that saw what happened firsthand in the Great War. Hemingway may be a little bit more than some of the others. During the war, Hemingway drove an ambulance. You can imagine some of the things that Hemingway saw firsthand as a person dealing with wounded during that war. African American culture really showed some significant change in the 1920s as well. Kind of at the forefront of this was a movement called the Back to Africa movement. It was led by a guy named Marcus Garvey, who really advocated for a separation of the races. Marcus Garvey traveled around the country and basically everywhere he went saw the same thing. Garvey saw how African Americans were perpetually being held back and just generally mistreated. And eventually he got this notion in his head and said, you know what, we shouldn't have to deal with this. If white people don't want us around, why are we still here? He really pushed for African Americans to return to their homeland or the land of their ancestors and basically set up a new country or a new America somewhere in Africa. The 1920s brought us the Jazz Age. The Jazz Age is a phrase that was coined by F. Scott Fitzgerald, that lost generation writer. But really what he was doing is he was talking about the popularity of jazz music. Jazz music is a blend of kind of old-fashioned ragtime music and blues music. It starts down in New Orleans and really just takes off all over the country. It's also kind of seen as a popular expression of the African-American culture that winds up being enjoyed by just about everybody in the country. Some of the better known and more popular jazz musicians of the day are these people right here. A guy named Louis Armstrong was a pretty famous trumpet player, very well known even up to today. Duke Ellington was a piano player. He got the nickname because his friends thought he looked like royalty. And Bessie Smith. Bessie Smith probably has one of the sweetest jazz voices of any jazz singer out there. Last but certainly not least, we need to talk about a thing called the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was a burst of creativity of black art, literature, and music that really happens in the Harlem area of New York City. That's kind of the epicenter. This creativity really expresses kind of the pains and joys of the black experience in America. This burst of creativity really catches on with just about everybody in the United States, including the whites. And eventually that culture kind of sucks some of the whites in. There's a really famous jazz club in Harlem called the Cotton Club. That became the place to go in the 1920s if you were in New York City. It didn't matter the color of your skin, black or white, that was the place to go to experience what was happening during the Harlem Renaissance. Probably two of the most notable Harlem Renaissance figures out there are both writers. The first is a gentleman by the name of Langston Hughes. Hughes is known for his poetry. It's a, it's a very creative kind of new wave style of poetry where Hughes kind of spells out the black experience for everybody to see. He really doesn't care if he offends anybody. He just pretty much tells it like it is. Another incredibly notable writer of the day is a lady by the name of Zora Neale Hurston. She really wrote of the black experience, but she also wrote of the women's experience. Uh, and she did so in a way that also was very inclusive of white women as well. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. A glimpse into the culture of the 1920s. So what should you take away from this video? Well, number one is this. Remember that radio created a national culture. Everyone across the country was basically on the same page because of this. Number two, remember that the 1920s brought us all sorts of new people. You've got new celebrities, sports stars, even the new woman. Last takeaway, number three, is remember that the 1920s really was a decade of cultural groups. You had the Lost Generation, the Back to Africa movement, the Jazz Age, the Harlem Renaissance, it was really about different cultural groups.
There you go, guys. The culture of the 1920s. Hopefully you got great notes and be ready for that quiz when it happens in class. And as always, remember, don't stop learning.